It only takes the most cursory of cursory glances to tell that Fast and Furious Crossroads is not worth the full-blown asking price of a big release game. With outdated graphics, awkward cutscenes, plenty of jank, terrible reviews, a four hour long campaign, and multiplayer that's all but dead, nothing about this game seems like it's anything more than a corporate cash grab. The fact that Bandai Namco think that they can charge full price for this, and then have season passes and DLC for the online on top of that, is nothing short of slightly mad. Slightly Mad Studios made this, who you may know as the developer behind Project Cars and Need for Speed Shift. Uh, having them make this is actually a pretty promising idea, they generally make well regarded races. Unlike those games though, which cater far further towards the sim racing crowds, this is arcade driving through and through, with very high acceleration, extremely high top speeds, plenty of drifting, and some good old car combat, which as we all know, Vin Diesel invented himself back in 2009. What we did was, very innovative on, on this game is create something called Vehicle Melee, which is new to gaming. If the graphics here weren't already enough to make you feel like you're playing a decade old game, the arcade genre backs it up with a campaign featuring heavily scripted linear set pieces framed by a surprising amount of cutscenes. This really does feel like a relic from the past in every way. I'd liken it most to like Spy Hunter on the PS2, or, or games like 007 Racing on the PS1, or, or really any of the 007 racing sections. It, it's somewhere between Bloodstone speed and explosiveness, and Nightfire's lock on combat. It's a real throwback and it's really really weird that this just came out. Maybe this all sounds like a negative to you, but I wanted to start here because it's partly why I have reasons to be charitable towards this game. Uh, I was raised by cheesy arcade driving games like Burnout, Midnight Club and Motorstorm and I've really missed games like this because they're more or less a thing of the past. Uh, I was also raised by the Fast and the Furious movies, I, I genuinely love them to this day, and with Crossroads being a Fast and Furious arcade driving game, I feel like I am absolutely this game's target audience. My expectations were still like through the floor going in, don't get me wrong, but on paper this is a game that I should like. So with all that in mind, the question has to be asked, despite its silly asking price and its obvious drawbacks, is there anything of value in this game underneath all that? Uh, well, I'm pleased to say that there actually definitely is. The most agreeably competent aspect to the game is the writing and performances. Uh, only Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez and Tyrese Gibson return here, but it's as fun as ever hearing them deliver cheesy lines with complete conviction. They want to play with fire? And let's turn up the heat. Revolving around an enemy group of legendary highway robbers who call themselves the Tadakul, who've apparently been highway robbing since the ancient times, which is exactly as silly as it sounds, the writing absolutely understands Fast and Furious's bonkers world with serious characters, and if you're a fan there's plenty of nods to stealing VCRs and mentions of Tej and Hobbs, and even the pink S2000 driving Suki from Too Fast Too Furious, which is a real deep cut reference. Too Fast Too Furious actually gets referenced a lot here because the game's new protagonists are from Miami and after an explosive start with Dom and Letty, things slow down and switch to these new characters and it really initially feels like a real bait and switch. Like I came here for Vin's oversized muscles that you just know that he asked to be bigger than they are in real life, not these two expats in Barcelona, but they're actually surprisingly well written too and have their own arcs and histories and they're played by well known TV actors Sonequa Martin-Green and Asia Kate Dillon who if anything do a better job than the cast of the films. It's not amazing stuff, but it's certainly not bad either, and it's also cool and unusual to see non-binary representation in a bigger game like this, especially when it's a protagonist. Uh, Dylan goes by they in real life, and their character Cam does too. Thankfully it's not long before the cast of the film join these two and find their way back into the story and the pace picks up again. It gets especially fun when Roman enters the picture, like Tyrese Gibson adds another level of cheese that this game really needed and you get that same sense you get from the movies that, that he's just sort of doing what he wants and having a lot of fun with it. Now, I didn't hear everything because maybe you didn't notice, but I was busy being held hostage and all. Later on they reveal that Peter Stormare is the villain who's basically being Peter Stormare with his signature offbeat American accent, and I love it. Your predilection for braggadocio has proven to be your worst enemy. What did he just say? 
Now, obviously, these cutscenes have a certain telltale-like unnatural quality to them. They're certainly not up to scratch by modern standards, and the writing and acting isn't consistent across the board, with a few too many stilted or corny moments that you sort of laugh at rather than with, but for the most part, it does feel exceptionally fast and furious. You can accuse it of being awfully cheesy, but so is the Fast and the Furious, and again, a lot of these drawbacks aren't acceptable for a full-priced game, but let's face it, we all know this will soon be in the bargain bin. There's one point in the story that I want to mention where this guy needs to raise 100 grand to pay off a gangster, and he owns a bunch of fancy cars that would easily be worth more than that. So the whole time you're just sort of thinking, why doesn't he just sell those cars? Uh, finally, Martin Green's character asks him, and he just says that he can't sell them without any explanation. It's funny to me that the writers felt that they should mention it, but then still not try to explain it. It's like, it's like, yeah, we thought of this, but we can't think of a reason either. We'll sell all our cars. Everything and settle the debt. No, no, you can't. I'm going to turn myself in. The gameplay is familiar. Uh, basically, every mission gives you something new to drive, and the handling for each car is actually pretty varied, but generally the acceleration is super high, so recovering from a crash isn't a huge deal, and you will be crashing a lot because you slide a lot and bounce off walls in a weird way. Uh, the drifting isn't unpredictable or dodgy, but you just drift really, really, really far compared to most games, which is a problem when other cars are constantly ramming you. On top of that, the top speed is extremely high. It's actually pretty exciting, flying past things this fastly and furiously, and it's fine when the roads are wider or when you're in the desert, like, it feels like it was designed around these sections, but in tight streets with plenty of obstacles and sudden tight corners, it can be too much to handle. Take a game like Need for Speed Hot Pursuit, the 2010 one, which has massive top speeds too, and similar-ish handling. Uh, they designed the streets to be wide, usually empty, and constantly waving forwards, very rarely having tight corners, and it works a lot better. Uh, of course, having a minimap helps too, and Crossroads is desperately in need of one. I wish the driving in Crossroads felt a little tighter overall, especially with the crash physics, like it's the kind of game where a lot of crashes just bring you to a sudden stop, and I wish the maps were better designed around the driving, especially considering this comes from a developer reputable for their driving games, but the game is at least forgiving enough that it's never a huge deal, and there are more than enough open maps that it's not constant. Uh, maybe I just need to get good. Again, for the 79 Aussie dollars I paid for this, it is ridiculous, and at any price, it's something you might have to get used to or look past, but I honestly did not find it that hard to, and pulling off a nice drift or dodging traffic at high speeds still feels really nice. Most of the time you'll be switching between teammates taking down enemies either with your weapons or with burnout style ramming takedowns, and each car only has one weapon which reloads on a cooldown whether it's an EMP or a missile or a harpoon attack, and the weapons either have like a mash the button or a timing minigame to dictate whether they hit. The teammate switching thing is a cool idea, and I like that there's no singular protagonist which helps with that Fast and Furious ensemble vibe, but the switching is really only used when catching up to the action if you crash, or when the game tells you you need to switch. I think they could have easily added mini-boss opponents which require you to use each weapon in a certain order, or had races where you had to finish in both first and second, like in Driver San Francisco, but oh well. Uh, there is at least a relay race where you do keep switching drivers every lap. The weird thing about that race is you can't seem to win it, which is really dumb because the game tells you to win it, so when I first played it and I was losing, I restarted it near the end, and then I realised that the rubber banding is just so insane that it always kept opponents ahead of me. And at the end of the race you get T-boned in a cutscene anyway, so the result didn't even matter in the first place. Uh, and then later on, in the other race in the game, you have to win it or it's an instant mission failed screen. Uh, trust me, I found out the hard way. let everyone down. I should have won. Now in fairness, that guy used a boost and I wasted my boost earlier, so that clip is not nearly as bad as it looks, but it's still pretty rubber bandy. Uh, really, the game as a whole has a blanket layer of unfinished dodginess. Sometimes it feels like cutscenes are just missing, there's one point where Emrod says we're gonna need new rides, and then without warning it suddenly cuts to inside a car dealership where you have to escape. 
Or the other way more egregious example sees the family in their HQ at night, where they say they gotta go check out some launch sites, and then it cuts to the desert during the day, chasing a bad guy that they made a point to say was really hard to find. The only explanation we get is a loading screen which says that they cross reference some dust on an enemy truck to this quarry, which is fittingly ridiculous, but this is just so incredibly jarring. Uh, thankfully, these are the only two times this happens, but still. Also, there's plenty of long-winded loading screens because, of course, there is. Then there's the moment-to-moment -moment cheapness. That instant mission failed screen hits like a truck every single time. You never see yourself crash or die, it's always just instantly bam, game over. Like, I want to see some explosions or something. Uh, similarly, if you even touch the edge of a lake or a river for even a second, your car will reset. Thank god there aren't many lakes or rivers. At one point I was playing a don't get too close, don't get too far tailing mission, which are lame in basically every game by the way, and this boss just decided it was time to let loose and start pile driving everyone, I guess. Lord knows how that didn't get the attention of the guy I was tailing. Another time I had to escape from the bad guys who were chasing me, so I drove up this hill towards where I was meant to be going, and doing so made the game take control away, blink to black a few times, show a random shot of nothing for a few seconds, and when it gave me control back, it put me in a different location and I'd lost my pursuers. This is probably the dodgiest thing that happened to me in my entire playthrough, and while on the one hand this isn't forgivable and the game does feel like it could fall apart at any time, on the other hand these glitches are never too punishing, and these bad ones are not that frequent. I, I never had to restart because of a glitch. Usually cracks just start to show when the world occasionally doesn't load in for a few seconds or with the really choppy cuts to cutscenes. Oh and one of the characters bios in the game's extras just has an image of them T-posing which feels like the most last minute thing ever. I, I, I can just imagine some intern being like quick double click our character model and take a screenshot we need to ship this thing. So it's super unpolished, and that can't be excused, but it's generally not game-breaking or frustrating stuff, so if you can get over that, you're left with a very straightforward driving game. It obviously doesn't reinvent the wheel, no pun intended, and because of its simplicity, it has to rely on its pace, set pieces, and story to be entertaining. Like if there wasn't any constant rolling dialogue while you drive around, as corny as that dialogue can be, the game wouldn't hold your attention and build tension nearly as well as it does. The driving alone is a bit whatever, but when you're keeping track of the story and the levels are constantly evolving around you and there's explosions going off everywhere, it can come together very well. And then there's the number of throwback missions to the films. At one point you do a semi-trailer heist at night in a bunch of hatches with green underglows, just like in the first movie, though it has to be said that Renault's aren't as cool as Civics. Uh, another time you tow a bomb around behind you and swing it into cops and sort of take them out just like the bank vaults in Fast Five, or how about the mission which has you chasing a train in the desert also like Fast Five? And it's hard for me to hate the bit where you're escaping from a caving in mine just like in the fourth movie, except here you're Michelle Rodriguez in a fair lady that was likely modelled after Sung Kang's one in real life. As a fan of the movies, this stuff is genuinely novel and it just sort of puts a grin on my face. The original set pieces are even sillier. Uh, chasing a hovercraft or an over-engineered looking tank or sneaking into an enemy base in Morocco, then running from a rock avalanche to escape. The finale really takes the cake though, which sees Vin shoot down a rocket ship as it's taking off into space, only for that rocket to shoot horizontally along the ground as you chase it down trying to stop it. Uh, enemies will try to take you out as if their mission hasn't already failed, and at one point Vin just seems to be able to slow down time as he jumps out of his flying car on top of the rocket, and it's just so extremely over the top and perfect as a finale to this messy Fast and Furious game. And at only four hours long, you're more or less shotgunning these sequences back to back to back, and considering there's really no depth here and each sequence is extremely scripted, it's exactly as long as it needs to be. You're playing this to exhibit a whole bunch of nonsense Fast and Furious ideas in video game form, and in that regard, it delivers in a very succinct manner, with fun characters and storytelling to back it up. But if you don't like the movies and Vin Diesel riding a rocket just sounds stupid to you, or hijacking a truck like they did in the first movie doesn't bring you back, or driving a Datsun out of a cave doesn't sound cool, or you don't like or know who Peter Stormare even is, then obviously you're just not going to have any reason at all to look past this game's many, many problems, especially when the gameplay is so simple. I'd tell you that you could maybe give the multiplayer a try, but it's pretty much dead now. 
Lobbies annoyingly need a complete nine players for a match to start, so I spent way more time waiting around for people than actually playing this thing, to the point where I started going mad and leaving messages on the PlayStation groups for the game, but once you finally get in, it's an alright time. Uh, three teams of three, with the hero and villain teams usually playing like a capture the flag mode or attacking and defending a tank or something, and then the third cops team wins if they take out and arrest all the heroes and villains. The weapons and scenarios are incredibly unbalanced, with rockets being way more damaging and useful than any other weapon, and certain maps being easier for certain teams, but it's otherwise a chaotic bit of fun taking down opponents for a few hours. It must be said that the sheer amount of effort that went into the multiplayer's unlock trees and stat screens in UI is astounding all things considered, and there's a trophy or achievement you can get for playing 400 online games, and I'm not even confident that 400 games have even been played total since this game released, so this game's already virtually impossible to platinum. Like the rest of the game, this multiplayer mode feels like it's from another era. It reminded me of Burnout Paradise, and it really threw me back when kids started having conversations and trash talking over the in-game voice chat. It, it has that Xbox Live 2010 energy. Y'all like Fast and Furious? Mm-hmm. YouTuber. I had a bit of an existential crisis writing this review because I know that I'm being way more positive on Crossroads than virtually anyone else on the internet. It's, it's sort of the popular game to hate right now, at least until Avengers comes out, and I really started to question if my standards were too low because I play so many dodgy games for the channel, or if I'm too nice to this because I like the Fast and the Furious, but I guess there are so many games that I try to review for the channel but just don't because they're too awful, and this is definitely not one of those. As much as I loved Prison Break, god my taste is trashy, I couldn't for the life of me have a good time with Prison Break The Conspiracy, even if Peter Stormare was in that too. I see Fast and Furious Crossroads as a series of hoops you have to jump through, or problems you have to turn a blind eye to, before you can enjoy it, and even then you still need to enjoy the movies and the arcade racing genre. There is a fun game in here underneath everything, it, it doesn't reach its potential by any means, and it's absolutely not worth buying until it's only 10 or maybe $20 tops, but it's one for the fans, it's the perfect sort of game for this channel, and it is not another Ride to Hell Retribution. I think, as this game finds its way into bargain bins, history will treat this game well, because it's a trashy, Sunday afternoon, have a laugh sort of game that's nowhere near as good as it should be, but it's inventive enough with its set pieces, very focused with its pace and tempo, and not much like anything else on the market right now, and I appreciate that. And let's be real, how many games out there have Vin Diesel riding on top of a rocket ship? And with that, we wrap up the review. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to support, you can click like and subscribe and leave a comment and all that YouTuber stuff. Uh, or you can support on Patreon, and I sort of use this last section of the video to always thank my patrons. Um, if you want a more Fast and Furious video game content, I uh, reviewed the PS2 game a little while ago, and uh, it's a pretty impressive game I think. The, the graphics are impressive, there's a lot of customization, it's a very interesting little game and I'm quite happy with how that review turned out so I'm gonna leave like an end card with that review or you can see a link in the description if you want to check that out and uh, yeah now I want to thank my patrons so thank you to all my patrons, thank you to all the patrons coming up on the screen and especially thank you to my $5 patrons Adam Beals, Analog Man, Anthony Gallagher, Anthony Heisel, Big J, Blake Barnett, Boggy Online, Collar, uh, sorry, Connor Salinas, Cuggles, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Doe Pants, Down the K-Hole, uh, Evil Chicken, Hazardous Kirby, Jay Ghouls, Jenny McGlynn, Casey, Kane Ramsey, Kayla, Labcat, Lachlan Jones, Lucas, Ray Sevic, Maximilian Kunzman, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Michael Brennan, Mini Me prefers shorter Patreon names, Mrs. Mini Me, Mustache, Duct Tape, Oscar, Peaceful Cum, Quote, Plague, Raven, Riddlin' for Kids, Scott Hazlitt, uh, Sky Panthera, ooh, Siami Yusuf, hope I got that right, Tia, Terence Clint, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Great City of Lawrence, Kansas, uh, The Last Great Opium Den, Thomas Damsgaard, Trap Law Ross, Trevor Corbin, Trixie Emerson, Riding on Games, and Zindictive. That list is getting very long, which is very, very amazing. So thank you all so much for supporting. And uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Take it easy.